Um, so I'm Philip Shepard with Elan Stefani, um, our second conversation. Uh, and I, as, as we've mentioned, we're hoping to do a series of these because mm -hmm. it's just so much fun. Um, and I wanted to begin this with Elan's permission by posing a question with all the with all the challenges we face and the problems that beset us do you feel at the core of our humanity of our way of being in the world do you feel that there is a a single issue you could point to that is driving I, I mean, I don't know, even know where to begin, but you know, from, from the climate change crisis to the species extinction, to the acidification of the oceans, to our societal um, angst that, that seems to be growing. Um, I'll hand it over to you because I'm really, I'd really, really love to hear how that feels to you, what comes up for you. Yes. <laughs> Simple answer. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now it's my job to keep myself from exploding. That's not fair. And it's funny that you introduced a series of conversations. It's so much fun. Let's talk about species extinction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's true too. So, so, um, I feel invited to, to say something more. Uh, the topic is, I, I talk as if I would be certain because I am certain, so I, I do not want to waste my time with polite aroundness. Um, the topic is trauma. And it all became clear to me when I had to face my own trauma scars and my own traumatic um, uh, symptoms coming from trauma on many levels, on cultural trauma, sexual trauma, developmental trauma, shock trauma, trauma prenatally as a hypersensitive person, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a point where I couldn't handle the dysregulation in my nervous system anymore and believe in my story. It will all become better quite soon because it didn't become better. And I studied somatic experiencing from Peter Levine and then the polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges. And at the same time, or maybe with my kind of notion of translating stuff from one universe to another universe, it suddenly became so obvious to me. I am an individual nervous system being organized around undigested trauma until now with myriads of symptoms of dysregulation. All of them can be summarized as suffering. I suffer, everybody around suffer, suffers from that. There is no winner in the game. Nobody knows the way out. Everybody is telling, I want to do it better and nothing changes. And then it became obvious, we as mankind are another individual nervous system. In this case, the cells organized in this highly dysfunctional nervous system are just our different bodies. That's all. And from that, I could say moment, from that moment on, honestly, I do not have any open question around why we are not thriving on a global and individual level. I do not have any open question. The open questions that I can develop after a kind of consideration and looking close at it is how well we are still doing and how much we are still willing to stay alive. Even though this might be a superficial level, but it shows something around our resilience that is quite amazing. I mean, that we still stand up in the morning is amazing. If you have an insight in a felt sense about the amount of suffering coming from trauma on individual slash collective level, is, it's tremendous. It's horrific. You cannot afford allowing that all at once and you cannot afford healing that, uh, feeling that. So, um, and, and to make a very long 
story short around where does it come from? Um, I do not know. I do know several kind of scientific backgrounds that I feel quite convincing. And one that I like a lot or that makes a lot of sense for me is uh, published by James DiMeo in the book Saharasia, Saharasia, I think, like coming from archaeological research in the nowadays area of the desert Sahara and finding there 6,000 years ago matrilinear societies, peaceful, balanced, um, feminine goddesses, super much close to nature, living embedded in the elements, etc. And then he writes something must have happened around, let's say, the first developmental trauma of mankind that the human nervous system couldn't digest. To some extent, the super rich tropic paradise that is now the desert Sahara turned into the desert. And people couldn't cope with that. And to so somehow they had to flee and the generations being born on the flight didn't grow up with regulated parents that could teach them how to orient in the environment. There was too much lack of food, deprivation of touch, of safety, etc present without escape and there was no time after that in safety in order to unwind and that is i think the core thing that we from there took as i cannot pass on how to regulate because everything that i am is already based on this regulation so it's transgenerational trauma par excellence because it's something like 6,000 6, years. And it, it gives words and it gives a story to this kind of, it is vague. And then, no, I'm not traumatized. My parents didn't beat me. Oh, my parents didn't beat me up too. Happy to hear that. And of course, a privilege. However, we do not have to look into individual stuff that must have happened in order to explain why we are addicted to suffering so much more than to true pleasure. And, and the problem, the, the problem, why am I talking about trauma being the thing, whatever you want to change, you want to change it. You came into the position of wanting to change it because something is not matching your essence. It's not matching your regulated instincts. It's not matching your biological design. That is how you can develop the situation of, I want to change something. There is a friction between the inner truth and the thing that happened around that. So whatever you want to change, look at your nervous systems in terms of trauma and what a nervous system needs in order to unwind from trauma. We can apply that to just everything. And it would be a high way for us being shocked and delighted and overwhelmed by insight and living up to our true potential. I mean, we are powerful and we have potential in a way we cannot put into this world human beings are a kiss for this universe. I mean, mm. it's, it's amazing what we are capable of, but we do not have role models because nobody <laughs> was living up to that. We just see it shimmering at the horizon and we're like, wow. And, and we project that into privileged spiritual scenes, but, but that's not the thing. It's inside, it's not outside. It's not seventh chak chakra, it's the first one. So whatever you want to change, look at the trauma signs being available today. Apply it when you are baking cookies and when you are going for a walk with your dog. Just make it a 24-7 thing because it's so worth it and because you deserve it. And the other thing is let's look at how trauma blurs our perception or twists our perception. And I think this is 
existentially important on a collective level because at the moment almost everything that we do in order to save the world is a symptom of trauma confusion instead of something that will add something good it's based basically on humans being a problem and they are not it's a trauma symptom symptom thinking that my species is a problem it's showing up problematically yes but we are not a walking problem, we are a walking gift. No way around that in our essence. And the other thing is, if we, if we keep sitting on this charge of trauma, we will fight anything that comes close to a solution around saving this world because a traumatized nervous system doesn't tolerate a sudden big leap into freedom or energy. It panics. So that is why I'm worrying, worrying so much about trauma being somehow known as a kind of thing in the background that also runs the show. But it's so important that we stop running from freedom by providing safety for our nervous system when it comes to more energy. And if we do not do that, we will run in circles until we have burned everything, which is a very reliable thing in a few years. It's just, this is not a theory. And I, I could talk so much about what people could do differently in order to save the world. But for now, that's the thing. The thing is, we have to apply how trauma twists perception of a current situation to how we are perceiving the planet right now we have to apply that we we can be smarter than a trauma but we have to be incredibly smart in order to be smarter than a trauma and people highly underestimate how much trauma is running their life highly they think oh go to trauma therapy and i like i know that i mean i i'm called pretty intelligent and i was like yay let's fight against my trauma and then my trauma was like talking with me and since then i'm doing my homework yeah thank you for this question and for allowing me so much space around oh um, no thank you for gathering all that into our awareness um there's so much uh i want to respond to i i love i loved your your sense that we're running from freedom by seeking safety um there's there's such a, a an impulse in our culture to make ourselves safe and it's a it's a bit of a fantasy safety because i've noticed that if you're alive you're not safe if you're alive, you're going to be hurt. You're going to get sick. You're, you're, you're going to die. If you're alive, you're going to die. Life isn't safe. Not to say we can't take measures, um, you know, to, to uh, support life and help it thrive. But, but to me, there's a, the, what we are missing in that rush to to establish safety around our lives is that is that the alternative to safety is security and there's only one security that is truly yours that is always there for you which is the security of your being and we have dissociated from that and people generally i think understand that um you know, safety uh, doesn't really exist. Um, and, and there's this impulse um, that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe if I'm, life isn't safe. So maybe if I'm less alive, I'll be more safe. And, and people contract their life, they measure it, they calibrate it, they, they regulate it into this, into this um, congested, tiny container that, that is writhing in, in agony 
for its constraint. We each of us belong to the wide, wide world. Mm. And I think like there's this huge um, conjunction between your response to that question and what my response would be because I agree that it is trauma. And here's, here's how I see it. I, I think the essence of trauma as it shows up is a dissociation. And we are taught systematically to dissociate from the body and live in the head. The head should be in charge. So there's, there's the first trauma and we, we are obsessed as a culture, as individuals with organizing everything. We organize our thoughts, we organize our, our emotions, we organize our responses to someone else. You know, you meet someone you know and you're already, you know, smiling before you've had a chance to feel their being, to feel their presence. So, so we, we, we cannot stop organizing, which is the strength of this intelligence in the head. And, and what that means is that we can never be present because I think the essence of that experience of being present is when you feel yourself being organized by the present. You, you feel the world permeating your being and informing it and organizing it. And that is the, that is the wave your life, your life rides on. And when I look at trauma, I'm looking for the, the archetypal, the prototypical, the original trauma that we are facing. And, you know, I take it back a little further than 6,000. I take it eight to 10,000 years ago when we discovered agriculture and we domesticated animals and we built permanent settlements. Every part of what we call the Neolithic revolution radically changed our relationship to the world, but it radically changed who we knew ourselves to be. So, you know, there's that thing of pushing the seed into the ground for the first time. And now you own that seed and that bit of earth. How can you own the mother? How can you say this is mine? I'm, but but it, but that's what happens. And and the, you know, the little plant growing up beside it is now a weed. There's no such thing as a weed. Every plant is a gift that is is nourishing and being nourished by the rest of the world. But now suddenly we have weeds and, and suddenly we have vermin because that animal coming along might eat my plant and I have to kill it. And that tree growing up beside my plant has to be cut down because it's putting my plant in shade. And suddenly the, the whole world is schismed. And, and you know, we, we look at nature not as an expression of of the abundance and creativity of the goddess, but we suddenly look at nature as as material, as raw material. We we experienced some technical difficulties, but we are back. And I was they have tradition. Every every conversation of us needs a technical issue. Just yeah. everything. Yeah. It's, it wouldn't be the same without that. No, it's like those Persian carpets that that uh intentionally weave a little imperfection into them because only god is perfect so i was i was talking about how the neolithic revolution not only changed our relationship to the world but changed who we understand ourselves to be mm -hmm. and and the way planting a seed changed everything how how suddenly you're building a, a, a home and it's a permanent thing. And so you're no longer just gathering branches. You're, you're looking at a tree, this, this living manifestation of the goddess 
now as raw materials and thinking, well, well, that that limb would make a perfect ridge pole for my house. And so you cut it off. And our word material etymologically comes from a, a root that means mother. Mm. So we have debased the mother and 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 turned it into utility something to be used um and and the very act of of building a house is one that separates you from nature i mean in english we refer to nature as the out the great outdoors well here's the house here's the door and outside is nature and inside isn't nature i mean that's what we've done we've we've excluded nature from our uh day-to-day -day lives our little sanctuary in the house and so suddenly you know when you're camping you can't imagine there is a separation because it you're interpenetrated by nature at every moment but here in your house you know your windows are closed and it's cold out there and it's warm in here and you might venture out and then venture back in but there's there's a, a boundary the door that separates you from nature and we domesticated animals now when we domesticated animals we became what would turn into our god so we decide when the animal's going to die we decide where it will live. We decide when it's going to mate. When 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 the animal has has progeny, when it gives birth, its children are our property. And that's exactly the relationship we established with the, the God looking down at us, um, you know, moving us, imposing his will on us the way we imposed our will on domesticated animals. And, and that whole, that whole change, the massive, massive change in our relationship to the world was at the same time, a dissociation or a denial that separated the male and demeaned the female the female became utility in the same way that that branch of the tree became no not a manifestation of the goddess but but utility Wom a woman became property in the way that that this patch of mother earth became my property and there are these three these three things that you can trace that happened concurrently as a result of the Neolithic revolution. One is we left the mother as the center of our family, the center of our community, and we turned to the father. The other is that we left the goddess um, who, I mean, there are, you know, in the, in the prehistoric carvings, there are numerous Venuses and almost no men. The mother was, was the center of the world of the creation. And then suddenly it's the father. And we moved our, our, our uh, allegiance from the goddess to the god. But not only that, we moved it from the earth to the sky. So the goddess was manifest through every trembling leaf. And now the god is is up there un, unattainable unseeable abstract um and and we've left the earth on which we leave now with all of those massive changes in who we were the center of our awareness the center of our thinking moved in our bodies it was in the belly in the in the early neolithic the the paleolithic and then it rose up to the heart where it where it lived in the time of homer and then it moved up to the head where it lived in the time of plato and we've been there ever since and that whole move from the woman 
to to from female not woman but from, from female to male is a shift that mirrors what we were talking about earlier from security to safety we gave our allegiance to control we gave our allegiance to abstract concepts that could organize the world and and hold it still and and um exploit it to seem to assure our longevity and when i identify the primary trauma of our culture it is the trauma between male and female within us and between male and female in our relationship to the world and yeah we've made progress and there are women ceos and women prime ministers but the women who most succeed tend to do so by um, upholding male values I, i'm i'm really encouraged by the prime minister of new zealand who seems to be forging a new way of uh, of leadership a new form of leadership but that trauma is one we are born into we are born into a culture that you know a real human is a man um and somehow a woman is is secondary um the real head of the household is the man a real leader is a man and and you know the fact that i don't know about about in german but in english every every leader of every organization in our culture is called the head of that organization i don't care you know it can be a church bake sale who wants to be the head of this bake sale or it can be a multinational corporation and it's the head should be in charge and and to me i feel these poles in the body between you know this male form of thinking and this female dwelling within the world in relationship in feeling and they are so complementary but they have been severed and they've been they're systematically severed when you take a child into our education system and you say hold your body still and fill your head with the right information you are over years and years enforcing that divide to the point that we come to believe that we can think more clearly when we segregate this portion of our intelligence from all that noise below the neck and then the solutions that we seek to address our problems are top-down solutions that assume that we just need to assert more control mm. and we are we are we are stuck in this dissociation within ourselves within the story of our culture between male and female mm. This is, there is such an interesting point that I feel like not kind of ready for talking about, but I want to try. I want to put the two of us into some kind of investigation because I could put it into that words. I kind of, and Okay, I'm not a native speaker. I do not know about the distinction between safety and security. I have a vague sense of how these terms are used differently. However, let me stay with the word safety. Still then, I could say I disagree with you. And I would like to zoom into that in order to put us on this trace of investigation. That is, you say, I say, people look for safety. I have to make it safe. 
So basically, they want safety. So they experience a lack of safety. The urgency, the obsession with making life safe, more insurances, etc. The others might starve, other continent, please. My house, my money. Even dissociating in order to feel safer because people desperately need more safety. You say life isn't safe. Like stop fantasizing about that. And I totally get that. And at the same time, people are looking for safety because safety exists no matter what. They look for it into the wrong direction. However, feed this nervous system with safety. And that is like, it's a temporary kind of disagreement just in order to which, which path do we go. But I'm super interested in, let's, okay, I, I will finish that sentence and then jump and then head over. Mm. People are looking for safety in this world, Philip, because this world is safe. This world is safe. That you die, that you have pain, that you get hit by the bus doesn't have anything to do with your innate sense. This world is safe. People are looking for it because they want to restore their inner <clears throat> lucid perception. So they would not have to fix the outer world, but would have to untwist the inner perception of the outer world, which would then lead to changing the outer world as well. So this is such another thing than us saying, everything is love and light. I'm like, uh, no, obviously not everything is love and light. Just, just look around. Not yeah. everything is love and light. That's blah, blah. But if we tap into the innate sense of safety, we are... Philip, we are destroyed by every moment. Every moment of your life beats you up. What is safe about that? And you running into this moment before time, before the world exists, you, you collapsing, imploding into this moment, into the heart of this moment, makes you be inevitably safe. That is why people are looking for safety. So that is the end of our temporary disagreement i think but i want to investigate on that with you because you said we come with a top-down solution and that doesn't work it has to come bottom up mm -hmm. and uh, maybe but but this top down is like let, let's do something differently and i think when we say this world isn't safe we somehow again try to apply a top-down solution get that it isn't safe and that is a weak point in how you tell the story because people have to jump over their instinct that knows this world is safe with all the horror with all the nightmare with all those crying children at night this world is safe and if that is tapped into in the inner world then the moment it's like it's a fragile moment when i listen to you and it's like this world isn't safe because you somehow lose my instincts because my instincts are obsessed by safety because they are right and because they are looking for safety in order to unwind from trauma in order to then show action <laughs> for the rest of the planet so that's that's something that i feel so interested in and so alone with that whatever people do I do not see them doing anything wrong. And I do not see it working when we say do something differently. I want to teach people systematically, and that is what I cannot do at the moment because I didn't talk enough about it. I didn't do enough research about it. I want to teach people why it is good what they are doing in their worst addictions. Another example that I feel super interested at the moment, I start working with men who are porn addicted. And I feel so thrilled because everybody is like, just stop watching porn, that's bad sex education, etc. Of course it is, but they are no idiots. They know that themselves. So Not they information. Oh, it's like, 
thanks for telling me and taking <laughs> things so serious. So what about looking at, sorry for the, I used this example, how about zooming through all those layers of images, associations, whatever there is problematic in, around porn, zooming into the heart. This is why you have been addicted, because you saw the essence in your drug way better than anywhere else. So you are loving yourself and you are on the right path. And this is somehow, and then from inside, porn would go away wherever it's problematic. Like making people starve, it would just stop because it doesn't make sense. It just stops we would have to take on effort in order to keep making people stuff on this planet. So it's like, then it's an effortless way through. And what I like the, the even more is every time somebody tells me do it differently, he or she has influence on me by my school trauma of do the right thing. And we then still, if it's about doing the right thing instead of the, the bad thing that destroys the planet, we still have a separation between spirituality slash non-dual awareness and action in the world, which is about the right thing instead of the wrong thing. The moment that you or me or anybody can hack whatever people do, the worst mafia boss, the worst killer, going with everybody, the path of energy, the path of instinct, until in the very core, the killing ends, the unsafety ends, the safety ends, the words end. And then we would have a species that is good without an alternative. And we would have brought that back into awareness on a path that is already able to reflect that back. And my worry is, if we do not reflect that back, you are inevitably, in inescapably good, no matter what you think about yourself. If we do not carry that on, on the path, we basically will be slower and less efficient. Thank you for listening to so many words. I just, I couldn't resist jumping onto that because I'm reflecting so much on that and my terminology is not good. Um, but I think it is essential. And, and uh, I, I appreciate like listening to you and all, all your wisdom and knowledge and then placing um, a stone into this bridge with a kind of proposal or suggestion. How about exchanging one stone? How would the game shift? Would the bridge work better or not, et cetera? So I, uh, yeah, I feel super, super interested in that. Well, me too. Um, as you speak about addiction, I use different language. You sp speak of essence, I speak of being. Mm. But I think we are gravitating towards the same thing. Um, when yes, the security of essence, exactly. There. That, oh, yes, now, there. yes. Mm -hmm. there. So, so um, safety, you know, when I hold a workshop, I speak about creating a safe space. It's so important, but, but so, the, so the language is inadequate to the distinctions I'm asking of it. Whether we know it or not, we are held in the embrace of the world at every moment. And we are held as a, as a, as a newborn babe is, is held by its mother. And there is, there is the security of being, the security of relationship, safety, as we think of it is something that keeps the forces of life from being able to reach us we put up barriers so life people are afraid of life 
when they come to rely on safety, when they internalize that control is the way to win, they're afraid of a lack of control. Life is chaotic. I mean, that's how it that's how it creates every moment out of the out of the seeming chaos, the deeper harmony of of everything yielding to everything else. So when I speak of the security of being, it's not contingent on contingent. it doesn't rely on circumstance. Mm -hmm. Not at all. It's always there. I mean, I mean, the circumstances are deadly. I mean, they are horrific. Yeah. I mean, there is no safety in that way. It's just absolutely not possible. Yeah. And still, there is this place of calm, this place of aliveness, this, you know, this sense. Here I am. That is that that is always there to come back to. Now, in terms of addiction, I think people, in my experience, have strayed, become desensitized to their being. You know, as soon as you move up into the head, you are dissociating from. I, I really feel the pelvic bowl is the cradle of my being. And you're leaving that. You're, so how do you come back to your security? So I know in the work I've done, there have been people, I'm thinking of, of one person in particular who had a reliance on alcohol and had done my work for a year or so and, and spoke of, you know, there's the bottle of wine and looking at it and it was there and I was here and there was no tug it was it was happy there i was happy here so so i really feel the the journey back to the body back to being is is what you speak of as the essence um how can you feel your wholeness until you come back to the body and without without landing in your wholeness how do you how do you feel the impetus of your purpose that is moving you into service that is engaging you with the world which is why i i don't argue for a bottom-up solution mm -hmm. when we speak of a bottom-up solution we're, we're sort of speaking of a closed system still this is me and I can be top down or I can be bottom up. No, it's an inside out solution. It's a, it's a, a dilation into the world and its energies and feeling how those energies illuminate your being in this moment and tug at you. And, and the solution is there in nature. Nature understands harmony so deeply. And to feel its harmony is to be guided back into harmony ourselves. Which in itself, when I listen to you, and it's it's such a it's a description that evokes immeasurable beauty, like the dilation inside out and high chaos. Oh my God, where does the solution come from? It's not only to ah. So it's exactly the same thing. It's like boom. And like, whoa, no control, just bliss. And that then means we have to be okay. At the moment, like, oh my God, we are running a little bit out of time, but just, I will be fast and super focused. Uh, exceptionally focused. At the moment, we are looking into the project of improving our own lives or saving the world around, if we want to use this terminology, uh, changing the world with, we have to do the right thing. And that's not a realistic frame. The realistic matrix is, there is an overabundance of just options. No, what baby? All of them are here to work. All of them work. So we, we have to, train our capacity for overabundance of solution and as long as we are saying like stuck 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 it's like we we are caught 
in the wrong place. Yeah. We, we, this is a twisted trauma induced misperception. It's not a question what we do in order to save the world. It's like, how did we manage to exclude this overabundance and over generosity of options? And the moment that we tap in one place into the security of our own being, because I love implementing your terminology for now, just in order to, to dive, because it is underneath of words. So we have to destroy the own terminology. We have to shift. We have to play in order to say, Words are not here for being right. They are here for juggling. They are here for colors. They are here as another version of kissing back to this existence. And then underneath, it's like, how did we manage to unsee that, that we are? So yeah, again, my promo clip for us tolerating overabundance of energy, of, of fun, of, of being right. I mean, being even good eventually, but let's not trigger. <laughs> <laughs> she did not necessary way. <laughs> oh, Philip, this would be so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, we won't be able to run from the fun. We have to be prepared for that. And the, the fun, what is most fun always involves risk mm -hmm. always intensity yeah i mean without that element and... of risk mm -hmm. and and so we've 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 left you know we don't want to risk um and and so we we control instead and and there is i mean just to say it in our culture we mistake harmony for control we, we, we think they're the same thing and they are opposites. You know, control is a top-down implementation of a set of ideas on a system to organize it. And harmony is what happens when every, every part of an organic whole responds without any resistance to every other part. It has to be set free. Harmony is the yeah. child of freedom. Yeah. If you try to possess it, if you try to be in harmony, you did everything wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and if there's one quality our culture lacks, it is the quality of harmony. Mm. And we're trying to create harmony, which is doing everything wrong, because that's that's control, that's not harmony. But but we And in the core it's still run by our innate, like essential remembrance. We are meant to live in harmony. So that's a tragic. The the wrong direction ends up being wrong, but it has to be the right direction. Just yeah. to work. Because because until you follow it, you'll you won't learn what you needed to learn. I mean these 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 instincts that take us to something, my God, there's a deep lesson waiting for you wherever, wherever it takes you. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful because we are all walking students and walking teachers. We are walking lessons, learning our own stuff the most. So beautiful. Yeah. Like we are walking over abundance and love and running around as if everything would be a leg. Oh. I know. And just this moment, just this present dilated moment has more riches than we could ever begin to gather. Mm. It's all there. Or to create. Yeah. It's been a joy. <laughs> Thank you. I, I look forward to our, our next opportunity to dive into it together. I'm super interested in, in the, yeah, the questions, the ideas, the journeys it might take. Yeah. yeah. Thank <laughs> you. To be continued. <laughs> Absolutely. Take care.